Well, you've heard the bad news. Are you ready for some good news? We've got it for you coming up in this episode of the Good News Program. The program you are about to watch is part of a free series we are making available to you as a gift from Greg Fritz Ministries entitled Living in the End Times Without Losing Your Mind. Visit gregfritz.org to download the MP3s or watch the streaming videos for free. Are you tired of hearing nothing but bad news? Tune into the good news of the gospel. Welcome to Good News with Greg Fritz. Hello, this is Greg Fritz. Welcome to the Good News program today. We are in the process of teaching out something that's been in my heart for a long time, and I've entitled it, Living in the End Times Without Losing Your Mind. You can get the study notes uh, from this teaching from A to Z on our website, and also we have it available as a free download. You can get the audio or you can stream the video uh, immediately. All 20 episodes can be yours absolutely free. You can go to our website on the home page and get that. We would love to hear from you. We are hearing from more and more people all the time. When I started this program, I, it, it was to, a total faith venture. I was, you know, I didn't know if anybody was ever going to watch. But we are getting reports from people, and it is heartwarming. It is so encouraging for me to know that you're out there. I'd love to hear from you. You can call us or send an email, go to our website, leave a testimony. I read them all. I see your names. I pray for you. I laugh. I, you know, a lot of people will write in and, and you'd be surprised how many people comment on my shirts. And I traveled for 30 years in churches and I don't think anybody ever commented on my shirts, but uh, it, it seems to be a thing. So, uh, you know, go ahead. Take your best shot. Here's a shirt. Let me know what you think about it. In fact, I wore this shirt on this program, this episode, just because you can't say, I mean, really, can you say much about this one? It's just gray. It's a gray shirt. So uh, l l let me know what you think. Um, I know some people have their favorites and their least favorites. Uh, but we, we just love our interaction with the people. Thank you so much for being part of this audience. I believe we're doing something that's, that's the will of God, that's right on time, and it's just what God wants. And, and you know what? I hope you appreciate the, the fire. We, uh, we don't have to turn that on. But let me know what you think about the real flames. And believe me, they are real. I sweat drops gallons of sweat so that we can have that fire. My TV guy wants the fire on. You have to do whatever they say. You know, you have to, you know, submit. But uh, uh, that's a real fire, and it gets so hot in here because of it. But we do it all for you. We want you to have a good experience. In fact, when I started making these programs, that was the one request that I had. I said, please m uh, make the program excellent. I, I don't want people to look at it and turn away because it looks cheap or cheesy or fake. Uh, we want them to see something of quality because I believe that the Word of God is quality. The anointing of God is quality. So we wanted every level of our outreach to reflect that. So hopefully you like the program. Many of you listen on podcasts and you don't see any of this. And, uh, and that's fine, too. In fact, I, I'm more comfortable speaking behind a microphone than, a, than in front of a camera, believe me. But um, we are, are, are just exploring new ways to get the word out. And it's working. It is working. There is a good news audience out there all over the world. And we love and think of you all the time. We pray for you. And I prepare messages just for you. You'd be surprised how many times during the week I'll think of something or see something or learn something and think, oh, this is going to be good for my audience. They're going to love this. I'm going to save this. And I'll write it down or I'll memorize it. And then we bring it straight to you. I'll tell you, there's a pipeline here that God can use uh, to get tremendous amounts of truth and revelation through me to you. And that's what it's all about. So thank you for being there. Let's go back to John chapter 3. I love this encounter that Jesus had with a religious man. This will help us as we relate to people. And I'm going to make this statement again. You probably feel this way as, as much as I do, but there would be hardly any stress left in your life if we could just get rid of all the people. 
people cause most all the stress that we deal with on a daily basis in our lives. But we can't get rid of all the people. You can't isolate yourself and live on an island or in a cave. We've got to deal with people. In fact, we have a responsibility because we're Christians to reach people. We have a message that they need to hear. We have a Savior they need to meet. We've got truth that they need to understand. And so we're going to constantly relate to people as long as we're here. And Jesus gives us a great example of this in John chapter 3 as he relates to this religious man. I'm just going to read through this. If you want all the teaching on it, get the series or download the MP3s or watch the streaming video. Uh, it's, it's free. You should get it on, on uh, living in the end times without losing your mind. But here's what happened. Verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And so... The point I made was, that, you know, not only did Nicodemus not want to see Jesus in the daytime because he was ashamed to be seen with him in public, he doesn't even give him the credit that's due him. He didn't worship him or identify him as the Savior or Messiah. He just simply said, we think you're a good teacher. And that's really big of him, wasn't it? And so it's kind of annoying that he's not willing to go all in and and we were you know related this to people in our lives that don't say the right thing do the right thing they're just annoying and we want to have compassion and love toward these people rather than anger and bitterness <laughs> and, and and being just irritated with them and Jesus didn't let these things bother him whatsoever Nicodemus should have asked a question of the Lord if you ever get God's attention in a physical, natural way like that, ask him something, you know. But Nicodemus just sort of said, we just think you're a good teacher. And Jesus did something that's most remarkable. Jesus literally answered the question that Nicodemus didn't know enough to ask. He said, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. To me, that answer that response to Nicodemus shows more restraint more love more mercy more compassion than anything else Jesus could have done it would have been so easy to say you know get out of my face or leave me I don't have time for you you're ashamed to be seen with me I'm ashamed to be seen with you and whatever but Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus's heart he saw that behind this religious facade was a poor little sinner who didn't know right from wrong, up from down, and needed God. We need to answer the question. Even if the world's not asking, we need to fill in the blank. We don't need to meet them halfway. We need to meet them where they are. We ought to be motivated by love. And as we do that, let me read this verse to you. In 1 John 4, 17 and 18, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. How is he? He's full of love, compassion, mercy, grace that is offered toward this generation. God is not mad at the world. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. And he who fears has not been made perfect in love. I, I just think that is a great scripture for us today in this world where we're tempted to be afraid or angry or both. We are not being perfected in love when we allow those things to dominate our thinking. Perfect love, being motivated by love, casts out fear. If you're f fearing, you haven't been made perfect in love. We see the perfect expression of love as Jesus dealt with Nicodemus. We need to implement that in our own lives. Use this, this method for people in your life that bother you, that irritate you, that always seem to say the wrong thing, that, that kind of have the wrong way of looking at things. Maybe they don't have a good work ethic. Maybe they don't have good manners. Maybe they're not tactful. Maybe they don't really approach you the way they ought to with the respect that they should. 
All of these things happen all the time. And rather than being bitter and angry toward the world, let's see through the facade and realize that these are people who need God. They need what we have. They need the answers that we have in our lives. I summed this up, this encounter that Jesus had with a very familiar verse, and it's John 3.16. I believe that John 3.16 is a weapon that every Christian ought to have in their arsenal every single day. Not only is John 3.16 our message, it also reveals our mission. And it's simply this. If you don't know it, you should. John 3.16, one of the most popular verses in American culture, it says, For God so loved the world. Isn't that good? That alone is a message in itself. God loves the world. God's not mad at the world. We are not reflecting God to our generation when we're angry and bitter and arguing and bickering. That is not what God's um, saying or doing right now. That's not His response to the world that we live in. Even though it may be frustrating to live here at times, God loves the world. For God so loved the world that He gave. He didn't love the world and take. He didn't love the world and punish. He loved the world and He gave. That's our mission. That should be our heart. We should love the world and give. He gave His only begotten Son. All He's asking us to do is give compassion, give mercy, give some patience, give them some space. And I'm not saying this to make you a doormat. I'm not saying this to take away your right to be who you want to be and to, you know, take a stand for what, what belongs to you and all that. I'm, not try I'm just trying to give you these truths because operating this way is a better way to live. It will be in your life, it'll, you'll be happier, you'll be more assured, you'll have more energy. You know it takes a lot of energy to be mad and, and, and bitter. That takes a lot out of you. It's a whole lot easier to be happy and to be full of joy and forgiveness and to relate to people. I don't have a bone to pick. I'll tell you, I watch things now on the news and see different political parties fighting one another and newscasters giving their viewpoint. And, and, and I really, you know, I don't have a bone to pick. I'm not angry at anyone. I'm not unhappy. I'm not, I don't have something to prove. All I want is for people to find God. You see, I don't see it as people against people. What we have going on here is the devil is against people and God is for people. Satan has come to steal, kill, and destroy, and he's trying to divide our nation. He's trying to divide people with, with racial boundaries and financial boundaries and political boundaries and all these different ways that we identify people. And God sees the whole human race as one. Jesus came and died for everybody. So it's not the world against each other. It's, it's Satan against the world. And God is for the world. And it's my job to try to bridge that gap, to be a minister of reconciliation. And we do that by having a message of love, a message of peace, a message of joy, a message that draws people and it doesn't repel them. I see this in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave. We love the world and we give. We don't have to give our only begotten Son, but we need to give our patience and we need to give our love, our wisdom, our, our understanding. Give people space. Don't expect them to ask the right question and respond exactly the way we think they should. People are going to do things that shock us and surprise us, but we still need to be there with the answer, with the help, with the message, with the, not only the message, but the method, which is love. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We have a message of life. Isn't that great? We need to keep these things in our hearts and minds. We need to have this attitude that we are not part of the problem, we're part of the answer. And the way we're gonna reach the world, and I believe we ought to be effective, we ought to be voices, we ought to be influencers, we ought to be involved, but not out of anger, 
and not out of fear and resentment. We ought to be involved through love. Love ought to be our motivator. In fact, I want to take you to this story because I, I refer to it from time to time, but it's in Luke chapter 9. And I want to read this to you and show you how things have changed and how God expects us to change with from one covenant to another, from one testament to another, from one dispensation to another. What is our role in the world? What should we, what position should we take? How do we operate in this, uh, in this divided world? In, uh, in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it says, It came to pass when the time had come for Jesus to be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers before his face. As they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. And they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, this is verse 54, when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? And, and I think this is a great illustration of how things have changed since the Old Testament because Elijah really did do this. He was not received properly. In fact, these captains in their 50s came to take him to the king by force and he, he, uh, he didn't choose to go with them and he called down fire and consumed them. And after he had done that a couple of times, the whole attitude of the army toward Elijah had changed. They respected him. In fact, the third captain said, Oh, man of God, have mercy on me. And, and if you've ever been in the ministry or preached to people, you'd think, now that's more like it. <laughs> I, I, I'm okay with that. The first, the first two captains says, come down and go with us. And the third one, after, after the first two groups had been consumed by fire, said, Oh, man of God, have mercy. And, and this, is, this is what James and John were, were reading and referring to. They were used to these Old Testament prophets of fire and brimstone and, and judgment and harshness. And, and Jesus, you know, came and he did miracles. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, the Bible says. And James and John, uh, when, when he went into this village and they didn't accept him and they, re and they didn't respect him, they just reverted back to Old Testament thinking. And they said, let's just, let's kill some of them. Can we just call down some fire? I guarantee you their attitude would change if we just consume some of them. We don't have to kill them all, just half of them. Let's just consume them with fire, Lord. Let, let's, and, and I'm sure they're thinking, Lord, you're just too nice. You, you, you just, all you do is bless people and they, don't, and they take it for granted. Let's kill some people. <laughs> Do you know how easy it is to have that attitude? <laughs> it's easy to think that way when you're surrounded. You know, let me use this illustration. You, you've seen the T-shirt that says it's hard to be an eagle when you're surrounded by turkeys. And, and, and you feel like you're in the world. You're just full of, it's just full of crazy people. They have all these ideas and, and, and you, just, you just feel like, have I, have I been, did I, did I go to sleep and wake up in a foreign world? What has happened to the world? Rather than, than have this idea of anger and retribution, I have to remind you, we're in a New Testament, a new covenant. We have a new position now. We're not Old Testament prophets killing people. I'm sorry to tell you that. I know that's very tempting at times. But here's what Jesus said. He said in verse, this is Luke 9, verse 55, he turned and rebuked them. And he said, and now they were only trying to do it for his own benefit. They were just trying to get people to respect him, but they were going about it the wrong way. Did you know you can have good intentions and you can have people's best interests at heart, but you can go about it the wrong way? If you're out there attacking and yelling and fighting and bickering and angry and hateful, it, 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 that's not the right spirit. Think of John 3.16. For God so loved the world and say this, and so do I. You could say God's not mad at the world. Neither am I. 
God's not angry with people and ready to kill them, and neither am I. We need to reflect God and the new covenant in this dispensation of grace. Whether you like it or not, everything changed when Jesus was raised from the dead. And Jesus is trying to prepare them for this new way of ministry that they were not used to. He rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you're of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. I just think that is a mouthful. When you take that statement and you put it with John 3, 16, you have a good idea of how we are supposed to relate to our world. Jesus did that with Nicodemus. He didn't threaten Nicodemus. He didn't resent Nicodemus. He didn't send him on his way until he had a change of attitude. He met him where he was. He related to him with love and compassion, and he won him. He won Nicodemus. We hear about Nicodemus later on. Did you know when Jesus died and, and his body was in the tomb, Nicodemus came and, and helped prepare his body for burial. Nicodemus was a lifelong convert, no doubt, but it happened in a moment where Jesus had compassion when he didn't have to. He could have, uh, he could have ignored him. He could have refused to meet with him. But God so loved the world that He gave. He gave His only begotten Son. That sense of love and compassion and giving should dominate our thinking. It's a better way to live. Can I just say, you don't want to go back to Old Testament days. That's not a better way to live. That's not a better covenant. It's a worse covenant. And so when, when you want to give people what they deserve and you're angry and hateful, you're not... He said to the disciples, James and not, you don't know what manner of spirit you're of. They had not unknowingly gotten onto the wrong track, followed the wrong spirit. And he said, you don't, we don't do that anymore. That's not the way we live life. We have the supernatural agape love of God that can dominate now. And that love never fails. Judgment doesn't always work. Fear doesn't always motivate. Doesn't always change people. But love never fails. Why use a lesser weapon when we have the greatest weapon of all, the love of God? If you'll develop the love of God and see the value of it that's inside of you, you can release, you can trade anger for love. You can trade bitterness for love, fear for love, and walk in the love of God and be a force in these last days. Fear involves torment, and perfect love casts out fear. There is a key here to living life in the end times and not losing your mind. And the key is live like Jesus did. Let love dominate you. If you're out to get people, it's not going to go well. If you're out to get even with people, if you're out just to make your point and win every argument, you're just going to waste a lot of time and energy and emotion. It's so much better to yield to the love of God and develop the love of God and love the world like God did. Let that love that's in you flow out and dominate your thoughts and minds. Amen. Well, what a wonderful teaching. I love this subject matter. It's very practical. It's something you can put into practice in your life right now, and I know it'll make a difference for you. Let me just say this. I, I need your help. We are making more programming. I've got lots of series uh, lined up that I want to create. It takes money to produce them. And I can say, I don't need this money for me. We've been well taken care of over the years, but our budget does not include t TV program production, podcast production, uh, all the Facebook posts, all the things that we're doing in internet and around the world. These are extra expenses and I just don't have the money to do it. And I believe that the, the viewers and those that, that are part of our Good News audience can help. You say, well, why do you have to talk about money? You ruined the program. I hope you don't think that way. This is not a, a, an arm-twisting um, you know, session where I'm trying to make you feel bad and guilt you and manipulate you into giving. It's not like that at all. You can give whatever you choose. And if you don't have anything to give, I understand that completely. But why do we have to think that about ministry? Listen, there's no 
price that's paid for ministry. It's free. There's nobody that has to pay a ticket or pay a subscription to, to, to watch and to hear our program. And that's the way we want it. And there are many, many people that will never be able to give anything to, to, to make this program work. But don't, don't begrudge me for mentioning it because it's part of the process. The Lord wants people to get involved. He wants us to do this together. He doesn't want me to be self-supported. He wants us to do, a, do, do something as a group, as a family. And you know, when you go to a nice restaurant and you take maybe your, your wife or your husband and you go to a nice place and you have a memorable dinner and you eat and it's good and it's wonderful. Did you know they always bring you a ticket? <laughs> Wouldn't it be odd if you got up and said, how could you ruin this nice meal by talking about money? How dare you bring this ticket to this table at a moment like this? Get out of here. No, you expect it. You understand if you're going to eat at a nice restaurant then they're going to talk about money. So from time to time, we bring it up, but we don't even do it like a restaurant. We don't demand that you pay, but we do make this opportunity available, and people are responding. We're believing for 500 partners, and people are responding. People are partnering with us. People are giving, and we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. I couldn't do it by myself, and you know what? I wouldn't want to. I love the synergy that exists between me and those that, that support this ministry. It's a match made in heaven. You're going to be rewarded for it with things that I could never give you. When you support spiritual ministry, then there are eternal rewards available. One of these days, you're going to thank me <laughs> for giving you an opportunity to give because the money you give into the ministry and to spiritual things the, the rewards go on forever. It's one of the ways you lay up treasure in heaven. So pray about it. No obligation. But if you feel the Lord would have you help us, we would love to hear from you. You can call our phone number or you can go to our website. And we have several ways that you can give and become a partner. God bless you today. I look forward to the next program. And until then, may God's best be yours. In this new series, you will learn the keys to getting your joy back and enjoying life, even in these challenging days. Visit gregfritz.org to download the MP3s or watch the streaming videos for free. I would like to take just a minute to remind you of our new book. This is Living With No Regrets. It's dealing with things of the past that might hold you back. And if you're like me, there are events in your past that whenever you visit them in your mind, there was a sense of regret or sadness or sorrow attached to them. I realize one day that's not the will of God. You can be free from that. I share the truths of this revelation in this book. In fact, I share the very scriptures that I use to get free from regret. You know, I, say, I tell people you can get ready for your future by simply getting over your past. And if you read this book, you need to get ready to get happy. Get your copy today. Come to our website and we'll mail it out immediately. Sorrow, sadness, guilt, and shame are not God's will for your life. In his new book, learn how to apply God's word to your past and allow him to wipe away every tear so you can experience joy unspeakable and full of glory. Get your copy of Greg's new book, Living With No Regrets, on our website, gregfritz.org. Are you tired of hearing bad news? Partner with us to tell the world about the good news of Jesus Christ. That means there's nothing that you should be worried about. God's power is available to work on any level, on any problem, in any situation. The faithful financial support of our partners enables us to produce the Good News program. We invite you to donate and partner with us today. Learn more at gregfritz.org.